Okay. Good morning. So, what I want to do today is to um, plot out a route by explicit coarse graining from scalar active particles, which I shall define, to a field theory. So scalar active particles, for example, self-propelled spheres. So I'm talking about spheres, not rods, in order to not have alignment interaction between the particles, which is why I can think of them as scalar or point-like objects. Each particle has a, a coordinate, Ri, and on it lives a unit vector, ui, which tells you which way it's self-propelling. So no alignment interactions. So a consequence of that is that in bulk phases at least, and we'll see more about interfaces later on, the, as a system of spheres will not support a state of polar or pneumatic order, so these are zero. Um, and so the only slow variable is the density. So our target today is a field theory for a, a scalar density as a function of space and time that describes the density of objects like this which are moving with self-propulsion. So. Uh, the usual name for things like this, well, it depends on the, the rotational dynamics you have here. Um, let's consider uh, active Brownian particles. So this is the case where this angle, so this has a fixed propulsion speed, and the angle U is evolving just by rotational diffusion. So U is a unit vector, it lives on a sphere, and it moves around that sphere by rotational diffusion. Uh, so I'm going to consider first a single particle. Single particle. I'm going to give it a speed, which, for reasons that will become clear later, I want to be I a, a little more general than you might expect and make this speed, V0, itself depend on the position of the particle. So I can have... Uh, particles which swim fast in some regions of space and slow in others. This is a long U. And uh, I've already said what the, uh, the U dynamics is. Oh, and let's give this uh, angular diffusivity D sub R. So that's the rotational diffusion constant. Okay, so I'm going to start with, and I remember I'm talking about just one particle for the moment. So I can't talk about the density of a particle in any smooth and simple way, but I can talk about the probability of the particle being in a certain place and certain time. So I'm going to introduce a probability density. So this is not an order parameter, but I'm still going to call it psi. R U T. And given that this this is the dynamics, particles move with V naught along U, and U is a Brownian rotation. Uh, and I could add more things like, to, I could add a, tr a translational Brownian motion if I wanted, but I won't. Uh, the equation of motion for this probability density is of this form, minus div v naught u psi. So this is just propulsion. It just says that if there are some, pa if, if a pa the particle has, a, is a the, the probability of finding the particle in a certain place at a certain time is related to where it was previously if you go back along its propulsive direction. So that's a, a, a kind of advection term for the probability caused by the propulsive motion. And then the angular diffusion is this. So these, uh, I'll say what these are in a minute. So this is rotational diffusion. And uh, this is a spatial gradient as usual. This thing is the gradient operator on the unit sphere. 
So uh, in 2D, that's just theta d by d theta. But in three dimensions, there's also the usual thing. We won't need the form of this. I'm just explaining the notation here. So this is, in the if dr is a constant, which it will be, this is just a sort of a, a, a diffusive process on in U space on the surface of the sphere. So in 3D. Okay. So uh, the way we approach this is to expand this. This is a function of U everywhere. It's a function of space and time. But if I do a, a, an expansion, it's essentially in spherical harmonics on the unit sphere. So um, I'll write down the form we're going to write for this, but uh, that's what this effectively is. So I'm going to write at each point phi r u t is. And there's going to be a piece which actually tells me about just the number of particles at point r, which doesn't depend on u. That's I'm going to give these tildes because these, again, are these are a, it's a decomposition of the probability density for one particle. I should keep reminding myself of that. So it's not talking about particles, but a particle. So this is the probability of finding a particle, but that will also depend on its orientation. So I can write the term like this, p dot u, the next term, q tilde ij ui uj minus delta ij over d. So these things uh, look awfully like the uh, a, a, a polar or a pneumatic order parameter in uh, a many particle system, but the tildes are important and they're reminding us that I'm talking about this is essentially a way of writing the low order spherical harmonic expansion of a function on the unit sphere. So there are higher order terms here, which would tell me about a more complicated uh, pattern of probability density on the surface of the unit sphere. So this is the kind of uniform part, then there's a part which may be peaked along a certain direction and uh, something which looks more like a axial component. Okay, so uh, the procedure is, and I won't go through every detail, if we take uh, moments of this equation, first I just take the integral over u of it, I'll get an equation of motion, it turns out, for rho, and then if I multiply by u and integrate again, I'll get an equation of motion for p. These will involve these higher order terms, but then I'll show how we can truncate those. So if I do this, uh, integrate that over u, I find this equation, which I'm not exactly deriving here, but I'm telling you what it is, and you can go and check for yourselves if you want. This comes out with a minus 1 over d. That's to do with how this expansion here is normalized. Don't worry about that. Uh, grad v naught. Uh, and this was meant to be a row dot. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Functions. Yeah. They all are functions of position. Okay. In other words, if I take the the, t the integral over u of this equation, then that's telling me about the rate of change of the total number of particles, regardless of which way they're pointing at some point in space. And if I do take the integral of u on the right hand side, I get a term here because I got a u u. Uh, this is a uh, doesn't uh, this, uh, if I integrate this over u, this is an exact derivative in u. Obviously, this doesn't change the total number of particles in any particular place, so I don't get anything from that term, which is why the rate of change of the uh, row tilde component uh, only involves the first term on the right-hand side there. If I do the same for the next moment, so put in a u before I integrate, then I get an equation of motion for this coefficient as a function of space and time, p tilde dot equals, and what I end up with here is v naught, and that's now a row, and I get something from the diffusion term now, dr d minus 1 p, plus higher order terms. So the d minus 1 is interesting, but should be uh, understandable. Uh, this rotational diffusion process basically doesn't exist in one dimension, where the unit sphere consists of two disconnected points. Uh, and that's why this vanishes if you think of, imagine yourself smoothly approaching one dimension. 
So that second term on its own just says that if I had, if my uh, probability density has some p component, so it has some tendency to be peaked in a particular direction, that that decays at a rate set by the rotational diffusion process. But as well, if there is a gradient of uh, this product here, then this will evolve through that term. They involve Q and things that are even higher than Q. So the idea here is that rho tilde is conserved and slow. So I only have one particle here, but it's moving by diffusion. So it's total, uh, if I ignore what direction it's pointing in, it can't change its probability density quickly. Uh, it has to, the, the, the probability has to diffuse from one, one point in space to another. So that's a slow variable in the context of this single particle. Uh, P tilde, on the other hand, is neither. In particular, this term here says that in more than one dimension, at least, uh, the, uh, if I have a, a, a probability distribution for uh, the, the uh, position and orientation of particles, the orientational part of that will decay through a rotational diffusion of U uh, at a, a, a fixed time scale set by the inverse of this object here. Okay, so because this is uh, neither conserved nor a slow variable, um, I'm going to adiabatically eliminate it. So adiabatic approximation. I.e. this derivative is approximately zero. In other words, what I can do, I'm so what I'm saying is that I can get rid of the angular information um, by assuming rapid relaxation of P so that this is equal to that at all points in space and at all times. So that gives me this relation. P tilde is minus gradient V naught rho tilde divided by dr d minus 1. Okay, so then I'm going to just put this back into here. Well, actually, it turns out to be controlled. It's uncontrolled on the blackboard, but we have looked at the higher order terms, and uh, in a reference I'll give in a minute, you can show that uh, the final equations of motion are controlled, at least I think they are, in this case. So you mean you get the motion of the particles rather than the time? Yes. It will be a limit where... It was the, the it's the, it's basically the hydrodynamic limit of this, where uh, the uh, space and time scales controlling yeah. evolution of the density, which because these particles are effectively diffusing because it's you is taking a random walk, so they could do a persistent random walk. If on those scales, uh, those the, the the time scale set by that dynamics p is relaxing fast, then I believe this is controlled. Uh, Julian, I don't know if you have a comment about that. I th uh, yeah, I think I think um, okay. So my comment would be that okay, there are approximations here. I think they're controlled in the sense that we have a very good idea of when they're going to be good. I think if you do kinetic theory for gases and liquids and things, it's a much worse situation. Uh, so the particular choice of interactions I'm going to choose later on will be sort of not general, but we chosen to sort of help this look like a good approximation. So. Uh, at the moment, I'm more in, 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 the, in the game of showing that the kind of continuum equations can be connected to a specific microscopic model, even if it's not necessarily the most realistic imaginable microscopic. I think that's true.
Yeah, it will be as long as it's. Well, you might do because if. That's true, except eventually you get phase separation. So then, then you have to introduce length scales connected with interactions, which you then have to also make long compared to the length defined by that uh, basic process of the persistent random walk. Okay, right. So if I substitute that into here, then I get a closed equation for rho. This, is bec this was the target, except that this rho, remember, is the density, the probability density for one particle. So still some way of getting away from getting an equation for an order parameter, so like some kind of density field for a lot of particles. So then we get this, rho dot equals minus div. And just to remind you of what I just said, that this is a probability current now. It's not a current of, it's not a flux of particles. It's a probability current. And the form for this is here, minus v naught over dr d minus 1 d grad v naught row tilde. Okay, so uh, and uh, I'll mention it now. So in this paper with Julien in EPL 2013, um, among other things we show that these higher order terms are uh, in negligible under the kind of conditions that uh, Julien was just describing. Uh, there are some generalizations of this. For instance, I can add a run and tumble process to this if I want to. So I don't have to think about continuous angular diffusion. I can add translational uh, Brownian motion as well. Uh, and those are actually on the problem sheet for those of you who are interested. But my aim at this point is not to give the most generic model, microscopically, just to have a model which leads to uh, generic continuum equations. Okay, so um, what I can do is I can look at this probability current as a combination of uh, drift and diffusion. So I can write this as follows, J1 equals a V, which I'm going to put a big V and write the row here, and then minus D grad rho, uh, where these quantities are as follows. This is minus tau over D. I'll say what tau is in a second, V naught grad V naught. And D is tau over D V naught squared. So this tau is just shorthand for dr, d minus 1. And by the way, if you do add uh, run and tumble motion or any other different dynamics for the relaxation of u to this, all it does is changes tau to some more complicated thing. So as long as I have a angular relaxation time, this d here, by the way, is the diffusion constant of a random walk comprising that motion. In other words, a system which is moving with fixed speed along a, c a, a particle, along a trajectory whose direction is doing angular diffusion. So that's a, like a worm-like path. It's a persistent Brownian motion, and it's a very simple exercise to work out. It's at, you know r squared as a function of time. That's the diffusion constant of that basic process. This drift term is interesting. It says that if there is a spatial gradient of the propulsion speed, then uh, if I'm interested in, if, I, if I'm thinking of this as a, as a, a diffusion of probability, there's a drift uh, up or down the gradient of propulsion speed, and back towards low s low speed. Okay, now th the point about this though is that equation for the probability density of a, a single particle is the same as for a passive Brownian particle in the presence of this drift term. In other words, if there's an external force on it. So I could have, you know, derived that without this process, but with a, 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 a completely reversible Brownian motion. And not only can I think of it in those terms, I can also take that back to a Langevin equation for the same system. So the one particle probability current which 
change it a minute, just try it again. J1 equals V rho tilde minus D rad rho tilde. Uh, these are functions of position, uh, as specified over there. Uh, is equivalent to passive particle plus external force. course being specified by this drift velocity here. And that means that the dynamics of this one particle can also, at this level, having got rid of these higher order terms here by saying I'm, I'm interested only in the large length and time scale behavior, can also be written directly as a Langevin equation because this is a, a diffusive particle with some force on it. So I can just write down the Langevin equation for that particle. And hence, therefore, to, and there's a technical detail, he detail here. So this is an Ito Langevin equation. Which is this. Rate of change of position of a particle is vector A, which depends on its position. Scalar C which depends on its position, unit white. So, and this A is V plus grad D, and C is 2D square root. So the logic here is I have an active process, slightly complicated, but I do a, a kind of coarse graining on it. I take this limit of uh, large length and time scales, and I find that if I stand back from it, the fact that it's a persistent Brownian walk doesn't matter. It's got the same Langevin equation at large length and time scales as a genuine thermal Brownian motion with a force field. Right. Now, Ito, by the way, just says that if, if I, and this is, this is multiplicative noise, so the technical detail here is what that says is if you think of discretizing this equation, you evaluate this term at the start of the time step, and then you update R according to the right-hand side. Uh, there are other ways of doing it where this is evaluated halfway through the time step and so on, but this is this is the uh, proper Langevin equation for that process, as I've described it, of a Brownian particle with a force on it. <coughs> okay. Right. Now, um, what I really want, of course, is I want to have lots of particles, and I want to have them interacting with each other. So the having said that this is the dynamics of an individu individual particle, I now have to think about making a whole bunch of those particles interact. So there are lots of ways I could make them interact. I could have collisional interactions and so on. But the one I want to focus on is something we call quorum sensing nowadays. So So the idea is that each particle would be doing this as its own independent Langevin equation with independent noise, but now I'm going to have the particles talking to each other. And the way they're going to talk to each other is to say that the swim speed, which so far is some specified function of position, is going to actually depend on where the other par particles are. So this is now an interaction, so I can write that as V of R, and I'm going to write this formally with rho here. So this rho is not directly connected with that row. That's the probability density of one particle, which has now gone away. I'm not talking about probability densities anymore. I'm talking about Langevin equations for the actual random motion of individual particles. So all of the row tilde stuff was to do with deriving this. This row is an actual particle density. It's telling me how many other particles are where in my system at a particular instant. So this row, uh, which may be smoothed later on, but for the moment is going to be as follows, sum of particles, uh, something which I'm going to write as rho alpha of r, where this is the actual density of a particle, particle number alpha, which is, of course, a delta function on where it is at the moment. Put the alpha upstairs to avoid confusion. Okay, so what I've said is that the swim speed depends on the density in some neighborhood.
So a perfectly respectable choice for this would be to draw a circle just as John did for the Jonah 2 model and count the number of particles in the circle and make your swim speed depend on that. I should say though that because I've already previously taken this uh, long length scale limit, that circle should be big compared to the persistence length of the individual motions. So that's why uh, I I by choosing a sort of long range sampling for how the swim speed depends on the density, I can get that limit right as well. So this is a, a this um, is going to be a good theory for that type of interaction. If I have instead particles which collide with each other in some local way, I may be able to approximately re represent it by this sort of thing. And indeed, uh, we routinely do that, but it's not got the same uh, kind of formal justification in terms of what's going on in the microscopic sphere. I think so. <coughs> so as I've said already, rho here is not a probability density, but is an unsmoothed particle density. So I'm on my way to an order parameter. I mean, this isn't an order parameter. This is a bunch of delta functions. But if I think of some later on, if I can smooth that into some smoothly varying density, that's an order parameter. So if the equation of motion for a smoothed version of this object is my ultimate target here, how does the density of particles evolve in time? And that will be a Langevin, a, a, a stochastic PDE at the kind of active field theory level. So this goes to order parameter on smoothing. The smoothing will be done, by the way, by complete sleight of hand, which uh, John will that no doubt uh, detect. Right. So the point is now, though, that um, if I have a bunch of particles which are all obeying this, and my rule was calculate your the, f the, 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 the drift and the noise at the beginning of the time step, then if I say, well, now at the beginning of the each time step, I calculate the drift and the noise, and as I do that calculation, I count around and see how many other particles there are nearby, that doesn't change the form of these equations. In other words, this dependence here on R is perfectly generalizable to the case where it depends also on where the other particles are. So the Ito choice makes that transparent, I think. If you uh, just updating according to the local uh, drift and noise, or the, the uh, drift diffusion and noise, then it doesn't change that if I make the parameter, the parameter V, which controls A and C in this equation through the relations down there, also depend on what the other particles are doing. Okay. So I'll write something about that in a second. V at R. So this now depends on where the other particles are through this construction here. So in the same information, the list of where the particles are is the same as giving me that thing as a, a bunch of delta functions. Uh, at the start of time step, at the start of time step. So what that means is that I can write down the n-particle Langevin equation. So I'm still not got to a smooth order parameter yet, but what I can do is write the Langevin equations for this whole bunch of interacting particles. Uh, there are lots of them. R dot alpha equals, and this is now A, depends on where I am, but also on other folk. And C, likewise, unit white noise. Right, so this is enough to tell me what the uh, equation of motion for the smoothed version row, so for the collective density variable, which is my order parameter, actually is. To get there, I need to just uh, blindly give you a couple of results from uh, stochastic PDEs, uh, which I will do. But I think um, by the time we get to the final equation, it will be highly credible, given what I've told you. So let me just do the formal steps, and it won't take more than a couple of minutes. So there's a theorem about stochastic PDEs, which is Ito's theorem, which says that if I have a function of some list of 
stochastic variables obeying this type of equation. Um, this, the time derivative of this function can be found in terms of these quantities. So what I'm saying is that from a, a, a this, this particle just obeys an ordinary Langevin equation. If I have a function of its position, then there's a way of calculating the statistical random equation obeyed by that function. So this is formal, but let me just do it and then hold your breath and we'll soon be at the end. C. So the lambdas are all independent, so I'll put an alpha on there, but they're all separate. Dot df dr alpha plus c squared over 2 d squared f dr alpha squared. Um, and that can also be written in this way. extension here. So this is mathematically the same as that because this is a delta function. It just says if I specify a function of uh, space and I want to know if I've got a particle which is sampling that space through this process of moving around with some kind of random walk and I want to know how the function of its position gets updated in time, this is what happens. Right. Um, so as I say, uh, this is not presented in order to make you understand Ito's theorem, because I frankly don't really understand it myself, but just to show that in this particular case, there's a relatively complete path uh, between the microscopics and a continuum level description. So um, there's a, a way of dealing with equations like this, which if, if goes back, at least in this kind of context, to David Dean. A paper you can look up if you're keen. A Fizz A, 1996. Um, so there's a trick, which is to choose for F this rho alpha itself, which is a delta function of R minus R alpha. So this is also a function of R, if you see what I mean. So then you take this equation here, so I, oh, as, as I said, this is just a sketch, and I'm not expecting you to follow the individual steps, but I just want to show you that this bridge exists. I integrate that by parts. And note this relation, f dot r alpha equals integral f of r rho dot alpha r. So this is a moving time derivative of a delta function. It's just saying that the time derivative of this f at that position involves knowing where you're moving next. Uh, and this is the delta function saying where the particle is. And what do you get? And this is now hopefully starting to begin to look like uh, b back in the land of normal physics. What we get is this. Rho alpha. So this is a, uh, a, a this kind of indicator function, this this object here for a single particle. And this is completely formal, but at least I want to show you the path is there. Minus div A vector A times rho alpha plus del squared D rho alpha minus div noise C rho alpha. So this is an equation for rho alpha dot as opposed to r alpha dot. So this is what I've done. As I said, there's a Langevin equation, which I know from the way that these particles move in this quasi-Brownian fashion and inter interact. This is telling me how to update the position of a particle. I want to construct an order parameter field, which is going to be some smoothed out version of this thing, where I pick up a delta function from each particle, and then I do some smoothing. So I need to know the time evolution of an object, which is a delta function attached to the position of each particle. So that's not the same as its position. That's a function of space that has a big peak at the position of the particle, and that is the Langevin equation for it. So there's noise right here, and you get this funny combination of stuff. 
Okay, so now the complete sleight of hand, which is not really sleight of hand since I'm exposing it uh, in a full frontal way, um, which is to more or less just say, right, well, I add all these up, and then I pretend that this isn't a bunch of adult functions. I just say, well, let row be smooth now. So that's the process, and if you want to blame someone for that, you can blame David Dean. <laughs> right, so we sum on alpha, and smooth to give the Langevin equation for what now is an order parameter, rho, which is a function of r and t, and this rho is telling me the density of particles at position r at time t. So I can just sum that equation, and uh, when I do that, I get, unsurprisingly, that rho dot is minus the divergence of a current, and that this current looks like this. So it has an A row. So this A is V plus grad D minus grad D row. This D is the one I defined previously, V squared over tau, or tau, yeah, V squared over, V squared tau over D. And then here, the, what the question is, interesting question is what happens to the noise term there and that noise term turns into this so this we can't quite uh, blithely smooth the density for let's talk about it separately so c rho alpha okay so the deterministic part of this is exactly what you'd guess given what the one particle dynamics is it's basically it says that if the one, the one particle probability had a diffusion drift equation with exactly this form for the probability density. So here, if I just have a whole bunch of particles, it's not really surprising that their, their actual number density obeys an equation of exactly the same form. And then there's this part. So what's this? This is the sum of independent white noises with the Cs there, so multiplicative factors. So this is going to have a variance and the variance is going to be proportional to the density. In other words, if I look in any neighborhood, I've got n terms like this, and if I add up n independent uh, random variables, I get some a random variable with the same statistics but a, a square root of n as its uh, uh, RMS value. So this term, when you think about that carefully, turns into C root rho times a unit white noise a single unit white noise. So I've got it here, uh, the, because I have a sum of different noises here, then I can, if, 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 if in some neighborhood where rho is uh, well defined, all I have to do is just count the number of particles and that tells me how much noise there is in that patch. And so that's how in this explicit, albeit rather cheating way, you get to what is now a Langevin equation for the order parameter rho. So let me just summarize that. And uh, the, uh, this piece, I can write with, you see I've got grad D row here, there's various ways of writing that. So let me write it down in the way which uh, most closely connects with what we had in the previous lectures. So this order parameter current J is V row minus D grad row. So that's just taking this piece and cancelling it against part of that. So this is exactly a diffusion equation with an external forcing on it and exactly the same sort of noise as you have in ordinary Brownian motion. So even if you didn't believe the smoothing step here, actually what I can say is if you know this noise is here for ordinary Brownian motion, which you do by the fluctuation dissipation theorem, you also know it is here for active Brownian particles because I showed that they were at individual level behaving in exactly the same way once you allow that there's this effective force term on them. So this was probably guessable. And I'm sure if uh, David Dean hadn't written his paper, Julien and I would not have hesitated to guess it. So, okay. <coughs> so equal to passive Brownian particles, in 
interacting via a force field. And this force field is the following. Well, the force here, this is a drift. There's a diffusion constant there. That, dep that depends on position. If you remember, the diffusion constant is intimately related to the mobility. So the drift is the mobility times the force field. So if I want to figure out, out the force field, I have to take the ratio of these. So this, at a point R, depending on what the density pattern is around that point, and what I have is this, KBT, that V, which also depends on the density pattern, divided by this D, which again depends on the density pattern, because both of these have V0 in them, and V0 is now V of density pattern. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, the temperature will cancel, but uh, in that equation there, uh, D, I can always define the mobility in terms of D and KT. Uh, yes, it's interesting that the temperature keeps popping up in this process, although it's clearly not a thermal process, and it will keep popping up, and it will also keep cancelling out. So yes, that's a good point to warn you of. Uh, so it's just to make the equations look as like the standard ones as they possibly can. Yeah, okay. Right. So what's this? I can take that ratio. I have these expressions for B and uh, D. i just write it down now. So this is KBT. Uh, on top, I have minus tau over D V grad V. So this was V naught when I wrote it down originally, but now is this V, which depends on the density pattern. And underneath, I have tau over D V squared. So this is the drift velocity and the diffusion constant as calculated from my one particle process. And this is minus KBT grad log V. And just as a reminder, I'll say that this is the velocity of the speed of particles, which depends on where all the other particles are through the actual uh, spatial disposition of the orthogonality field. Okay, so that's fun. Um, because that means that in principle, if I'm used to thinking of a current as what I would normally have is the mobility times the gradients of the chemical potential here. Um, so I can still write it in those terms. Even though this is an active system, I can still write it in this pseudo-passive way. Beta. So this is d beta is the mobility, beta is one of the kt, the gradient of mu. So this will be an example of how kt cancels out, by the way. Uh, and then the noise is still here, 2d rho unit white, with an effective chemical, chemical potential now. And this has a factor beta in it, so that the, this is where the cancellation of T will be. Beta mu equals log rho. This is an ideal gas. From this, I get that term there, and uh, plus log V, which is, uh, I'll just write this way now. So this is from self-propulsion. plus quorum sensing. Okay. So you should, s just as a comment, if this was uh, going to be a completely equilibrium system, uh, this would have to be the derivative of a free energy. And that's where the, the, the line stops here, because in general there's no reason for that to be the der derivative of free energy. There may be special cases where it is, but what we can do is at least get to the point where we have an, a, a model which looks like equilibrium at this level. It's got some funny thing where the chemical potential would sit, but in general, that is not a, uh, a passive system now. So, yeah. Yeah, that's coming. You, you jump ahead. Okay. So, um, not equilibrium unless mu is df by d rho. 
so yeah, so we'll the, the, the next bit we'll be thinking more precisely about how that will break down. But first, I want to uh, proceed with this. So um, okay, so you can see that in steady state, I'm going to have a uniform mu. So let's just extract a little bit of physics from here. And this uh, connects closely with what Suzanne was talking about yesterday, of course. Steady state. Rho is proportional to 1 over V for that reason, because I've got a log rho and a log V. So this says that particles accumulate where they're slow. Um, and if, as uh, Suzanne also mentioned, so a, a quorum sensing could, of course, go either way. But if it happens that uh, V decreases with rho, then particles slow where they accumulate. And that gives me the positive feedback. which is the underlying cause for motility-induced phase separation, also known as MIPS. OK, so I just want to, to uh, you know, clarify the status of this. How are we doing? Yeah, let me take a few minutes break. Um, derived for quorum sensing. depends on rho in some longish range way. As I said, with a range that's big compared to the microscopic persistence of the particles. But uh, this is also widely used as an approximate model with various var variations for active brown particles with collisions. And you can see the attraction of doing that because collisions between particles also cause them to slow down at high density. So act, uh, 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 act, active brown particles uh, with collisions also have motility-induced phase separation. Uh, and an easy way to think of that is to just say, OK, well, don't worry too much about the details of this derivation. I've got a system where particles slow down at high density. And uh, because of this combination of factors here, that's going to give me uh, phase separation in the same way, and other models as well. OK, so let's have a quick break there. Uh, questions welcome uh, before or during. And then I'll say a little bit about how this model actually behaves. Yeah. Well, OK, so the, the, the it's, uh, I mean, as I said, it's a, it's a bit fishy. Uh, but uh, it was originally done for equilibrium systems, and the results of that are always what you would hope and expect for equilibrium systems, and particularly the way this noise term comes out is exactly what detailed balance tells you what it actually has to be. So there's th th our confidence in that is not because it's mathematically uh, completely transparent what's going on here, but by experience it seems to have given the right answers in all previous cases that we where we have something to compare with. So that's what I wouldn't defend it more strongly than that. Uh, mathematicians gasp when you do this and, you know, generally <laughs> threaten you with all kinds of sanctions. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to pause for a second.
persistence length. Then. Yeah, and you'd also there need to be lots of other particles within that range. Yes. 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 Well, exact. I think. In 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 the way that we're hydrodynamically used yeah. to talking about, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas, it, whereas if you're doing it here, th th so if you wanted to do it with you know hardcore collisions, yeah, right, it would be exactly like what you were talking about with kinetic theory that this is totally out of control, but it's still you should get the physics roughly right. Yeah. Mm. Okay, I can at least rub some of this out. One more minute and then I'll resume. Okay. So what does this model do? So the starting point for that is, uh, as you would with an equilibrium system, is, in, and we're interested, for instance, specifically in this phase separation. So we're interested in phase equilibria for a model defined dynamically that way. But it's also, I've got the chemical potential. I know what that's doing. Um, so what we can do is we can start with a mean field theory and try to construct a theory of phase coexistence as we would in equilibrium. And there will be a stumbling block there, which will be of interesting uh, in its nature. So let's talk about this. So what do we do in mean field theory? What we do is we compare in equilibrium the, the free energy densities of different uniform states and say, oh, well, you can uh, create a lower free energy by having some of this state and some of that state. And this is the common tangent construction, etc. So we'll see how far we can get along that sort of line. Uh, so we consider uniform phases first. In steady state. So if the phase is uniform, then this functional dependence of V on rho becomes, as John was quick to notice, just a function of rho, which is as if it depends locally on the density. But in fact, it's because the system is uniform that it doesn't care about how the density is varying in space. So effectively, V just depends on uh, the number, which is the spatially uniform value of this density. So I've got the expression for the chemical potential there. Beta mu is log rho plus log now V of rho. So this is log rho V. So I can think of this now because it's a uniform system, I can construct an effective free energy density. So we just construct mu is usually df by d rho. So we can certainly construct an f from that. And uh, what we get is that beta f, so then again, this is beta is always going to cancel in every property of the active system. Beta f is rho log rho minus one, which is an ideal gas plus an interaction, which has this slightly unusual form, integral from 0 to rho log v of s ds. And if you just differentiate this thing, you will see that the value of its derivative is mu, as defined in the line above. So uh, at this level, it looks as though it should be equivalent, in quotes, in mean field theory, 
to a passive system. free energy density, F. So um, that's partly true. The case where it's true is if we're interesting, interested in calculating the uh, local instability, so a spinodal criterion. So it is true that if this F has negative curvature, so mu has negative slope, then I have an instability. The system will, uh, if you look at what the current is doing there, it will uh, uh, be unstable to small fluctuations in which um, the uh, density fluctuations grow as they as you as as I move from place, place to place so um, the the spinal criterion which we had before for the equilibrium case was the following uh, the curvature well let's write it beta f double prime and this if I differentiate that again I get one over rho plus one over v dv d rho so the prime is a d by d rho here, um, when this is negative. Uh, so that's the condition for instability. Uh, and that's the same as d log v d log rho less than minus 1. So there's a graphical construction I can give you for this. I've said that v the average swim speed depends on density in some way. So I can talk about what is the average swim speed in a uniform phase at density rho. So suppose I have a curve which looks perhaps like this. So it has some initial value, some lower value at high density, some curve in between. And have I drawn that steep enough? I'm going to draw it a little bit steeper just because it's easier for what I do next. So let's draw this slightly more extreme. Um, so what's this condition mean? Well, it actually translates into the following thing. If I take a line, point from the origin, draw a line up onto this curve, I'm asking whether the slope here is less than the negative slope to the origin. So I just reflect this. If th as long as this triangle stays under the blue curve, the system is stable. So it's stable there. It's also stable out here. Uh, but it's not stable at a point like this. All right, so stable stable, unstable. So this is a kind of graphical way of constructing the spinodal just from the V of rho curve. But it, it, you know, it, once you've realized that there's effectively a free energy-like function uh, determining this condition, then that's just a particular way of finding where it has negative curvature. OK. So that's the spinodal criterion. But what we would like is also to know when the system is globally stable. So that would be the equivalent of calculating the binodals in an equilibrium system. In other words, what are the actual coexisting densities? So if you start in that region, you will phase separate. But the two coexisting densities, you normally have to compute in equilibrium from the common tangent construction, which I did describe. So let's think about global phase equilibrium. So the temptation, common tangent construction on F, and the reason I called it a temptation is because it gives the wrong answer. So that might seem a little mysterious because when I do the common tangent construction in equilibrium, uh, the, uh, I'm used to describing the system with a local free energy and some, some square gradient bits. And uh, the global uh, equilibrium only depends on the local part. That's what the common con tangent construction says. However, it turns out that the common con tangent construction is only true if the gradient terms in your equation of motion are consistent with the free energy. In other words, if the system is passive. And we'll see this explicitly either later or in the next lecture. So the wrong answer, the wrongness of this answer is to do with gradient terms because in a passive system, these terms have a specific form and their specific form is in fact the only reason why they don't enter this calculation. But of course, no textbook ever bothers to tell you that. In the active system, even if the equations of motion look like in the, in the mean field limit, they have exactly the same uh, free energy-like structure, because the gradient terms are not 
equilibrium-like and have bits to them which break time reversal symmetry, it turns out that you have to do something which is different from this, or at least only reduces to this in the passive limit. So that's a bit of a spoiler, but we'll 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 see that. Okay. So what I'm because of this, what I'm going to do next is uh, within the kind of model that I've been talking about over here, um, at least have a look at what the gradient terms should be. In other words, I've got uh, I have the 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 um, stochastic PD at the moment, with where in, in, in that PD is V of functional of rho. So that's not a square gradient expansion. So I have to go back to that, do a Taylor expansion of it, and see what kind of gradient terms actually come out. So that's what's coming up next. So the square gradient theory, or maybe I should just call it a gradient theory because I don't get exactly square gradient theory. So again, um, I could just start writing down uh, various gradient terms in the equations of motion um, in a phenomenological way and see what they can be now. Well, I'll do that later, but first I want to you know, actually see how they emerge from the coarse-grained picture. And it turns out it will be one of these cases where the coarse-grained model, it gives you a certain suggestion for what the gradient terms, terms are like, which is actually not really general enough to capture all the physics which is going on. So we'll, we'll encounter that problem later on. But anyway, let's see what we can do here. Um, as usual, rho dot equals minus div j. j equals, so I can write this as, well, I have d rho grad mu. This is the same thing as we had before. I can think of that as an m plus 2 d rho unit white. I've set beta equals 1 now. I'm just fed up with carrying around beta and having it cancel everywhere. So excuses for that. Uh, well, I will be setting it equals 1, even if it's not visibly 1 in that equation. So um, now we're going to have to decide what is the... Th this involves V of rho. We've got to think about what V of rho is like. So I'm going to suppose this. So V, which depends on the density pattern in my neighborhood here. So I'm going to write this, and uh, hopefully this won't be too confusing a notation. I'm going to use a tilde again. This is nothing to do with row tilde that I had before. That's gone completely. Erase it from your minds. This is a, a sampled density over some finite neighborhood. So row tilde is something like this. Integral of row r prime some kernel r minus r prime. So you can think of this as my kind of quorum sensing range is defined by this kernel, dr prime. So k is a smooth kernel. Of longish range. In the sense defined previously. And that's describing the quorum sensing. So what I can now do is Taylor expand this. So I'm going to assume that rho is slowly varying even on the scale of that kernel. So therefore, if I, if, uh, if I uh, um, well, I just proceed with uh, doing the Taylor expansion here. Um, rho tilde at R is the actual density at the middle plus something, which I'll call C1 times its gradient. This will vanish in a second. And then a, another coefficient C2 times del squared rho. So C1 is integral of s k of s ds. So for symmetric kernels, this is going to vanish. So that term is typically not going to be here, here. <coughs> uh, 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 this is something actually John also mentioned. I in principle, you could have some kind of asymmetric sampling of your neighborhood, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, equals naught for isotropic k. And C2 is just the second moment of this, half s squared k of s ds, and this is not going to be zero. That's basically telling you the range of the interaction. So what that says is that if I sample de the density over some small neighborhood, then if it's smoothly varying, what I get is the density of the middle plus a bit of del squared, because that tells me whether the average uh, around the outside is lower or above 
the density in the middle. That's what del squared tells you. We had that coming up in previous lectures more than once. Yes. Sorry? Oh, yeah, no. Uh, sorry? Where? What's missing? I don't need a volume. What this says is this k goes to zero at some large distance. Yeah, but because k, k, k is so let me just sketch k. K is something like that. So that just counts everybody in a weighted fashion within the range of your quorum sensor. Yeah, so uh, I can take the range of integration to infinity. Uh, I think that's uh, I think that's actually is true, um, which is interesting, and you can read about that in the paper by Alex Solange Julien. <coughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, the physics. I mean, well, certainly, it certainly it changes the quantitative phase coexistence is affected by that. Uh, whether that's a big change in physics is, is less less clear. Okay, so having done that Taylor expansion, uh, then what what that means is what I see in my equations of motion uh, v with its, uh, in principle, arbitrary dependence on the density field, I can replace it by something which looks vaguely square gradienty. So when I do this, V of R rho is approximated as V of rho, where this is the local value of the order parameter at position R plus a bit of del squared. And what we'll do is this, to V V rho, C2, which can itself depend on V, del squared row. So what that was was just to, uh, uh, what, I, what this was is to connect the s locally sampled density with the value at the middle and the, and the Laplacian. And then I also can Taylor expand this, which is why dv by d rho enters to get the thing over there. Yeah. Yes, because, uh, okay, so let's, uh, that's, that's an interesting question. Yes, and that's because, well, it, it won't in the quorum, pure quorum sensing system that I've described. But if I use this as a model for active Brownian particles, it can because your persistence length it depends on the density then. And the persistence length is somehow involved in your diffusion constant so for how far you can sample. Uh, yeah. Wait a minute. No, no, no. No, wait a minute. Um, well, yeah, V is a function of rho. But, yeah, but it's reasonable to think that this the range depends on the swim speed. So, if, no, yeah, so actually... Now, because of that, even in the quorum sensing case, it actually does depend on V in general, because if I, uh, it depends on your mechanism for quorum, sen quorum sensing. Yeah, in other words, if you sense over a neighborhood that explored in a certain time, rather than something to do with, say, confusion of a, a, a diffusion of a chemical species. So at least in principle, that could plausibly depend on V. Um, yes, so let's make that explicit. Quorum sensing range can depend swim speed. Okay. Right. So then I can uh, plug this into my expression for mu, which just involves log of this, essentially. So mu is log rho plus log v. Approximate as log rho plus log v of rho, the local one. So this is log v of r row just to be complete. So I do all of this stuff and s plug it into here and I get 1 over v dv d rho c2 of v del squared rho. And this would typically be negative for MIPS but that's a, a detail. So in other words I can write mu as a local part this, which involves the F that I can construct by uh, looking at the mean field theory here. Um, and then now this, okay, so V is a function of rho, et cetera, et cetera. So I can think of all of this part here in general as minus kappa of rho del squared rho. Okay. So I took a kind of fairly long path to get to, and this is not the most general form, uh, but that's what the kind of picture that comes out of this, this model here. So what I want to just point out then is that in general, that term breaks time reversal symmetry, and it does so because in general, 
I cannot get it from a free energy. So let me just make that explicit by seeing what we can get from a free energy. Yeah. Is there a bracket missing? The, the equation above the box. Du, 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 du. Um, where might there be a bracket? Sorry, you have to say that again. Log V, yeah. Yeah, so that comes through here. Well, if I expand the log V, I get the... the, the and, and if I put a Taylor expansion into there, then the derivative of the log is giving me this 1 over V, and then whatever lives here. So I don't think there's a bracket. Yeah. So uh, the kind of thing that I get in an equilibrium system would be this. So I can have a density dependent in my square gradient term in a free energy. So that's perfectly good free energy. I can't have anything very different from this at square at, at, the, at the level of uh, a the leading order gradient terms in a free energy do have to look like that. <coughs> um, so if I take uh, the, the mu from this, so mu subscript f has df d mu, f d a rho, excuse me, um, then of course I get the local part df d rho, the usual thing, which is all fine because that matches what's here. Um, but I get minus k rho del squared rho and also minus half k prime of rho grad rho squared. Okay, so um, in an equilibrium system, if I look at the chemical potential, there is a specific relation between the coefficients of the del squared rho term and a grad rho squared term. And here we have del squared rho with a density dependence, so k prime is not zero, and we do not have this partner term. So, yes. Um, because you have to, there you get two terms when you do the functional differentiation. And I yep. Because there's two pieces to, when you take the derivative, you've got to do a, 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 a derivative here and a derivative there. I know. Yes, then I get a minus sign with a factor of two. Yes, it is. I just wrote this down wrong. Excuse me. No, no, no. I, I do, do apologise. Let me just, just let's, let me just read my notes very carefully. See what I've actually got written here. I've got a plus sign there, but I also wrote this differently. Yeah, I mean, so okay. Let me tell you. Uh, uh, okay, so let me just say what I've actually got in my notes. What I've got in my notes is this: df d rho plus half k prime grad rho squared minus grad k rho grad rho. Can we agree on that? And is that equal to this? That's how it works, Irene. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. So you 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 the, the, you do get an you, you, the, the because you've got both dependencies here. When you take the functional derivative, you get a bit from the rho part, a bit from the grad rho part, and that the effect of that is to sl flip the sign of the one of those. Okay, <coughs> Okay. so that now becomes just an aside. Okay, so, um, yeah, so that means that in my quorum sensing model, I, one, way, one of the ways to think about this is to say that this is equal to an equilibrium-like term. So this is um, a along the lines I was saying in my previous lecture, which is to gather everything which could be equilibrium and then see what explicitly breaks time reversal. Now, there's more than one way of doing that because, you know, de depending on what you put in the equilibrium part, you get a different bit left over. But nonetheless, uh, the, uh, 
all the resulting ways of writing that should be equivalent. So I've got an equilibrium-like structure plus something missing. So this breaks. So so if I write it, if I if I choose an f, if I choose f appropriately with some square gradient piece here, then what I have there is an equilibrium part and a correction, and this correction breaks time reversal because there's no f, and it also destroys the common tangent construction. Okay. How am I doing? So um, there's one more note, by the way, uh, which is at, at the same level, I could have done some similar expansion in D. You'll notice I didn't really look at the diffusion constant. And then I'd get, uh, so I will write, let me just write this down. same level I could have something like this d lock plus d1 of rho del squared rho uh, but that's also true in passive systems and so long as d comes into the uh, flux to the, the deterministic term and the noise term in the same way, this does not break detail balance. In other words, to break detail balance that way, I'd have to have a, a different form for D uh, multiplying the, 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 the gradient of the force from the one which m is in the noise. So this we ignore. So i.e. the leading order TRS breakdown in the QS model is via this u not equal the FD rho. So I have an equilibrium like structure, but I don't have that. And this is where uh, I should mention that you know the, the if you choose a, 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 co a microscopic model to be simple in order that you can do the coarse graining properly, which is exactly what we did, you may be misled. And this is actually such a case. Uh, so this is a, a comment. So for more general models, and you can show this again from microscopics if you work harder, but this is much more recent. So Cesare, who was here, uh, showed this. More general models show a second effect. So a second active effect, and it's actually at the same order. Oops, can't write today. In the gradient expansion. Uh, which is of the form J is not mobility grad mu. So we will come back to this in a couple of lectures time. But for now, I want to explore the effect of this specific type of uh, uh, symmetry breaking term, which is the one that comes out of the coarse graining of the quorum sensing model. Okay, so I have uh, five minutes. Uh, what I'm going to do is I, I'm actually going to, I will start on the next bit, and if I don't finish, I'll just repeat it at the beginning of the next lecture because it's uh, worth repeating probably. So how do you construct the counterpart of the common tangent construction, or how do you generalize the common tangent construction to allow the possibility of gradient terms that break time reversal. And as I say, it's not so obvious that you should have to do that, but uh, the first, you know, we've, it, it, it is clear once you have done it. So this is, I'm going to call anomalous phase coexistence. Um, and so I'm going to slightly generalize this by putting um, well, all the terms that you can get inside a chemical potential, I'm going to uh, put in there. So I've got mean field theory. Uh, I have no noise. 
but I'm looking for steady states of this equation. Rho dot equals minus, um, yes, well, let's, if, let's write it this way, div m grad mu. Uh, mu is a local part, and I'm going to write two, the two terms that I can construct <coughs> um, that have, have come up here, both in the equilibrium and the non-equilibrium bit, grad rho squared, and then I'm going to put minus kappa rho del squared rho. So this was zero over there, but this is a slight generalization of that. And if I just refer back to what I said here about the equilibrium model, if f exists, 2 lambda plus kappa prime equals zero. So the su structure suggested by this model is to have terms of both types here, but without the relation between the uh, derivative of that term and this one that you would need to get this from a free energy. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it's the same, <laughs> same issue as we had over here. <coughs> yeah, okay. So what we're looking for is a solution of this equation, a steady state solution, so a solution with zero here that uh, connects two phases. So an interfacial solution so this is a nonlinear differential equation oops and it's going to have to connect a low density phase rho g with a high density phase rho l and the point is that uh, because it's a nonlinear differential equation uh, this solution will only exist for certain special values of rho g and rho l and those are the values capable of coexisting. So the binodals, in a completely general sense, so if I f forget that I could ever have done, ever dreamt of the common tangent construction, what I should be thinking of is stationary solutions to these equations uh, with these uh, coexisting densities as, if you like, eigenvalues of this nonlinear uh, PDE. So uh, this can be solved. The, 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 there's a procedure for doing the whole thing. Uh, which I will give you the reference for. I'll, I'll start talking about and then uh, pick up next time. Incidentally, it, it closely relates to something which Suzanne mentioned, actually, which is in these funny non-monotonic flow curves where you get shear banding. You have to look at gradient terms to figure out what are the coexisting um, shear rates. And the mathematics behind that is extremely similar to this. So it's, it's, it, the, the same sort of thing happens in other systems where you have non-equilibrium phase separation. You have to look at the gradient terms and see what they tell you. Uh, so the problem is to find rho L, rho G. And the solution is laid out in its clearest form in this paper. Oh, 602 R 2018 so this year okay so stationary solution current is going to be zero uh, you could have a, st a, a rho dot uh, with a non-zero current if you had periodic boundary conditions but not in any sensible state could you have a constant current flowing through the system that I'm trying to set up which is coexisting uh, liquid and vapor here so grad mu is zero so that says that if I look in the bulk phases and I just look at the what I called mu naught which is the local part here in the bulk phases all the gradients are going to vanish so the bulk uh, the, the local bit like the ordinary bit of the chemical potential has to be the same in the two bulk phases this is extremely simple and this we can call mu bar so I s the, the equality of chemical potential between the two phases is a fundamental to any kind of diffusive uh, equation that I have over there. So this cannot change. What can change is the other bit of the common tangent construction, which in the thermodynamic case is the equality of the pressure. Because in active systems, well, what is pressure? We don't, I mean, it doesn't have the same uh, thermodynamic meaning, and indeed it turns out that some other construction is needed. No, that's that's uh, that's different again. 
That's different again. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons for not dealing with that now. Well, what I'm thinking is, uh, okay, so this is meant to be a mean field level description of bulk phase coexistence. So I've got a, a dense phase here and a dilute phase there, and I'm treating this as a one-dimensional interface. So what I can't have is a current which is persistently going between the two phases. It would have to come back around the periodic boundary conditions, and it would behave in a very strange way. It's certainly true you could have circulations in the two phases, uh, but that's not going to come through as a, because I've dropped the noise, that's not going to easily emerge as a, as a deterministic solution of this. And if it does, it certainly is going to involve more than one dimension. So what I'm assuming is that I have a one-dimensional density profile, and that's what I'm trying to calculate. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, um, so the other half of this takes a few minutes, so I will stop there, and we'll pick up from this point uh, next time.